So what we saw last time is that when you have pollution, there can be a divergence, in general there will be a divergence, between what society wants to do and what the firm wants to do. So if, if Q is firm output, then and this is dollars per unit of output, then the last graph that we discussed showed the marginal product curve of the firm looking like this, and so the firm wants to go here to Q pi, where marginal product is equal to zero, because you'll recall that if marginal product equals zero, that is going to be where total product reaches a maximum so that it has a tangent line which is horizontal, in other words it has a slope equal to zero and that slope is marginal profit. I will also admit that if you happen to be at a profit minimum you also would have a horizontal tangent and marginal profit equals zero. So, uh, But those kind of complicated situations you're not going to see in this class. I reserve those kinds of things for uh, the, the class for econ majors. And if society suffers pollution from this output, then society would want to consider marginal profit minus marginal external cost. And society, therefore, we want to go to this level Q star. Q star is less than Q pi. Society would want the firm to move. And I ended the last video by saying that that's what we're going to be studying, is how to get the firm to move. Uh, obviously one way is to make producing more than Q star illegal, but there are other ways. What I want to do in this video is to set this conclusion into the history of economic thought. Because there's a long tradition saying that, what, that the free market does good things. In other words, it, that you ought to go to Q pi. And that is a tradition which goes back centuries. It doesn't take pollution into account, and so I want to talk about that his history. And I think the, the best way to start is discussing Adam Smith, the probably most famous economist who ever lived, who published his famous book called The Wealth of Nations, in a year that's very easy for Americans to remember. It was 1776. Um, Adam Smith was a Scottish professor. Oh, nowadays we would call him an economist. I don't think in those days they had the word uh, economics. He was, a, he was a university professor. He is... Uh, so let me give uh, the, the background. Before Adam Smith, the answer to the question what constitutes the wealth of nations? In other words, what makes um, one country more wealthy than another? It would be answered by the amount of gold a country had. This is one of the biggest reasons why Spain, for example, was so interested in conquering the, the so-called New World, the Western Hemisphere, so they could get gold. Because the idea was the more gold you had, the richer the country was. Adam Smith was the first person to say that's actually wrong. What makes a country wealthy is not how much gold it has, but how many factories it has, how many productive farms it has, how many industries it has, how many well-educated people it has. So Smith was one of the first people to see clearly that what makes an economy rich is not the so-called financial part of the economy, that is gold and money, but what we would now call the real part of the economy. Now there were other people who had said something similar. There, were, there was a, a group called the Physiocrats in France that said that um, uh, uh, land and nature was the source of all wealth, so that's going along that same direction. Um, but uh, Smith, I think, said it in, in a way that's a little bit clearer to modern eyes. Now, the, the people that he was writing against, the people who said, well, what's important is just how much gold the country has, th uh, those people were called mercantilists. 
And while the mercantilist economic prescription and economic theory was basically, as far as economists were concerned, was basically destroyed by Adam Smith, it still lives on today in various political movements. For example, uh, Donald Trump's notion that it's always better to run a trade surplus. You, you want to be selling more to other countries than they're selling to you so that you can get uh, means that you're going to be getting more money or in the old days more gold from other countries uh, than than uh, than you're giving them and so you're going to get a you're going to be building up surpluses of gold your 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 stocks of gold are going to increase so in other words if you run a, a balance of of, uh, of payments surplus you're selling more to other countries than they're selling to you then the result of that is that you're increasing your stock of gold and modern day mercantilists and i think uh, Donald Trump would, would be one um, would say th that's what makes a country rich is by uh, pi piling up all this gold or all this modern equivalents which would be money mm, the Adam Smith and economists since then in some sense said the opposite um, let's say when the US is running a trade deficit against China what's happening in the modern view is that the US is getting a whole lot of stuff, useful stuff from China, and what it's giving China are pieces of paper, dollar bills. Um, so if you look at the real economy, the beneficiary is the, is, is the government that's running the trade deficit. Now, obviously there are other things going on. One of it is the employment effects on the United States. So that story is too simple, but Adam Smith's big uh, advance o over over the mercantilists is to draw attention to the real economy rather than the financial economy. But uh, so in in this sense, he basically started modern economics on its way. But what did he say about the behavior here of private firms? Uh, here it's mixed, and so I wanted to to talk about three quotes from from the Wealth of Nations. the The first one uh, starts here. Let me just read it. By directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he and Smith now is talking about a business owner intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interests, he frequently promotes that of society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. So this is the famous invisible hand quote. And what it's saying is that if a business that, that when a businessman just sets about to maximize his own individual kind of selfish profit, that what actually happens is he benefits all of society, even though he doesn't intend to benefit anybody but himself. So he's led by an invisible hand to benefit society. So what's good for the business is good for society. This is a philosophy that says that there's no difference between what society should want and what private firms should want. In other words, it's a philosophy that says there really isn't a distinction between Q pi and Q star. Now, Adam Smith, of course, was not talking about pollution. He wasn't thinking about things like this. But the point is that he started uh, the idea that government should leave private firms alone. And if government leaves private firms alone and lets them maximize their own profit, what's going to happen is best for society in the long run, not just what's best for those individual selfish firms. Um, we sometimes describe this using a French term, laissez-faire, which means to leave things alone. If the government would just leave businesses alone, that would be better for everybody, including for all society, not just for the business people. So this invisible hand laissez-faire philosophy uh, 
is something that, that Adam Smith um, started. Another quote of his that goes along the same lines is this second one. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. So, in other words, we depend on the butcher, the brewer, and the baker to be selfish and to maximize their own profit. And the activities that they undertake in order to maximize their own profit are exactly those activities which enable us to purchase uh, meat from the butcher, um, beer, I guess, in that time from the brewer, and bread from the baker, and have a dinner. So, as I said, this supports the invisible hand quote that there are huge benefits to be gained from letting people be selfish and maximize their own profit. Um, you know, in, in the first quote, again, he says that, that, that that's actually more effective at benefiting society as a whole than if a business person actually tries to help out society, tries to be selfless. Now, uh, I'm going to give you the, the modern perspective on this in just a minute, but I want to point out that Adam Smith was a really smart guy. He wrote several important books. The Wealth of Nations was not the only one. Uh, I think an early one was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. So he was a moral philosopher. And one needs to be careful not to describe Smith in a way that's too simplistic. Uh, uh, along those lines, let me read the third quote. People of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. So here he's saying that if you don't have government intervention, and you let business people do whatever they want, they're going to get together and they're going to conspire against the public to, for example, raise prices. That doesn't sound like somebody who is always going to say government's bad and you shouldn't regulate business. And this is in the same book. It's in The Wealth of Nations. So uh, let's not conclude that Smith was naive or simple in his notions of of what would happen if he pursued a totally laissez-faire uh, policy. Uh, now, by the way, one of the reasons why Smith, despite this last quote, supported laissez-faire so much is because in his day, it was very very common to see what we would now call crony capitalism. In his day, if you wanted to get really rich, what you wanted to do is become buddies with the crown prince who was going to become king. And then once he became king, maybe he'd, for example, give you the trade monopoly on... Uh, the West Indies or let you set up a new colony in North America. So crony capitalism means uh, uh, means a bad relationship, a uh, uh, corrupt relationship between government leaders and business leaders. And in the United Kingdom in Smith's time, uh, the, uh, crony capitalism was not illegal and it was done all the time. So king got rich, all the important royals got rich, and they made sure that all their friends got rich by giving them government privileges, uh, legal privileges in the markets. That's the opposite of laissez-faire. So one of the things Smith was really fighting against was this crony capitalism. And he was saying if uh, this is one of the senses in which he meant that he wanted to get government out of business and industry because if you got government out of business and industry you wouldn't anymore have these this unfair uh, uh, situation where if you were friends with the prince you got all these economic privileges and you could become rich and you could destroy all your competition and this is another sense in which modern economists are very much 
in favor of what Smith said. Uh, you really won't find any modern economists that support crony capitalism. Uh, even people who think that government ought to regulate business don't think that government ought to regulate business in a way that benefits the politicians. So this is another big advantage. Smith was really speaking out against the predominant pa economic and political powers of his time in, in a way that was actually pretty brave. So what... Uh, what about nowadays? What, what do we think about the invisible hand nowadays? Well, one of the biggest intellectual achievements of economics of the 20th century was very careful mathematical investigation of exactly when is it that a laissez-faire policy is optimal? Exactly when should the government not regulate the economy? The <coughs> The, uh, the uh, 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 maybe I'll write their their names. People like uh, Kenneth Arrow, um, Gerard De Bru. I'm not going to ask you these names on an exam. Uh, they were mathematical economists, highly highly trained in abstract mathematics, who asked themselves what sort of abstract economy would described in mathematical equations would have the property that laissez-faire was the best policy that the government shouldn't interfere with the economy and here's what they showed they showed that um, laissez-faire is good if And then they have a set of conditions. First off, there's perfect competition. That is, as you know from our previous videos, the firms are price takers. Okay, already that is a highly unrealistic assumption. We've discussed this before. The vast majority of firms in a modern economy like the U.S. don't don't take prices as given, they, th they set their own price. Th they decide whether to raise their price or lower their price. They're price setters. They're not price, give they're not price takers. So this is the perfect competition assumption is highly dubious. What's the next assumption? No uncertainty. Now, let me make a distinction between uncertainty and risk, because I'm going to say that risk is okay. Risk means a random situation in which you know the probability distribution. So if you go to Las Vegas and you, you play uh, at some of the, uh, let's say, the card games, um, if you're interested, you can calculate what the probability of winning and losing a certain amounts of money is. So that's risk where you know the probabilities. Uh, uncertainty is when you don't know the probabilities. Uh, what is the probability that a Republican gets elected president 30 years from now? No one knows that. Uh, what was the probability that the D-Day invasion of France by the Allies in 1944 was going to be a success? Ex post, of course, we know it was a success. But what was the correct probability beforehand that it would be successful? There's no way to answer that question. We can't uh, get a time machine and run June 1944 a thousand times and see how many times the D-Day invasion of Nazi-occupied France was successful and how many times it wasn't successful. So not only future events, but even past historical events have the property that we don't actually know what the probabilities were. So the assumption that laissez-faire is good if there's no uncertainty. So there can be risk, but businesses have to be sure that they know the probability distribution of all possible future events that could affect them. And consumers have to be sure about this also. Let me interrupt myself to say that the distinction between the word uncertainty and the word risk is not a universally accepted distinction. 
Frank Knight is the economist who coined that distinction. We do have, a, I, I believe, a, a chapter later on in our book on uncertainty and risk. And so this is something actually that I could ask in an exam, the, the difference between uncertainty and risk. But you should understand that in other economics classes, the professor might not make this distinction between uncertainty and risk. He might use them as synonyms. So, so far we said laissez-faire is good if there's perfect competition and if there's no uncertainty. The next condition is that there is perfect information. Or actually, instead of saying perfect information, uh, let me say symmetric information. This means that the two parties to any transaction or any contract know as much information as the other party. So when you buy a loaf of bread from the grocery store, you and the grocery store and the baker who made the bread all know the same information about the quality of that loaf of bread. When you take your car in to get an auto repair, you and the auto mechanic have the same information about the condition of your car. When you go to a medical doctor, you and the medical doctor have the same information about your medical condition. When you sit on an Econ 3250 class, you and the professor have the same information about environmental economics, and therefore you can judge the quality of the information that the professor is discussing. Well, that last example already shows this, <laughs> this is a highly, highly unlikely condition to occur in reality. I mean, the reason you go to an Econ 3250 class, the reason you go to a doctor, is because the Econ professor and the doctor know more about environmental economics or medicine than you do. Indeed, in a modern economy, one of the things that makes a eco modern economy so, so productive is that we have a huge amount of what Adam Smith called division of labor. We have a whole amount of specialization. So doctors, you're not just a doctor now. You special, there are lots of different kinds of doctors specializing in all different kinds of things. There are lots of different economics professors specializing in all different kinds of things. The, the symmetric information assumption is an assumption that the buyer of a product is never at any informational disadvantage. The buyer knows everything that he's getting into. And in a modern economy, this is this assumption is very rarely true. Um, it's true for some things. Uh, uh, commodities that you buy, uh, you know, if you have a regular brand of bread that you buy in the grocery store, you probably know as much as you need to about that kind of bread. But in other kinds of things, from medical advice to what is the best cell phone plan, often the consumer is at a disadvantage compared to the seller. And finally, laissez-faire is good if there are no externalities. And here, of course, is where laissez-faire gets into trouble in this class. Pollution is an externality. Once you get pollution, QPI isn't the best place to be anymore. It's not the same as Q star. In this class, the no externalities assumption was violated from maybe not the first day, but certainly the second day. And if I've written here four assumptions. Laissez-faire is good if all these four assumptions hold. And if one of them fails, then laissez-faire isn't good anymore. Now, this doesn't automatically mean if one of these assumptions fails, that government regulation is better because government is run by people, not gods, and so government can make mistakes also. So you can't, it, you can't directly conclude from here that just because laissez-faire isn't optimal that we should, regulate the, uh, we should have government regulate the economy. But the only way you can prove that laissez-faire is good is if all four of these conditions occur. And 
I think a pretty convincing case can be made that in the modern world, um, it'd be hard to find even one sort of transaction where all these things occur. Maybe there are some, let's say a corn farmer in Iowa selling corn to a wholesaler. Mm, the the prices, uh, neither, neither the farmer nor the wholesaler is really affecting the price that's set on a worldwide market. There's no uncertainty because the the wholesaler knows what kind of corn the farmer has grown and he can inspect the corn if he needs to find out. So symmetric information is probably true. They probably both know as much as the other about the the quality of the corn. And there are no externalities I can really think of in that transaction. They're not affecting anybody else You know, when the farmer sells his corn to the wholesaler. So yes, there are some transactions in a modern economy where all these four conditions are satisfied and therefore uh, laissez-faire is good. Although I have to say that what Arrow and Debrou actually proved is that laissez-faire is only good if these four conditions hold for all the transactions in an economy. So, so and, and we'll talk about this a, a bit more in another context, but it turns out that if these conditions hold for some parts of the economy and not for others, then you can't necessarily say that even those situations where the four assumptions hold should be untouched by government regulation. In other words, um, there can be interactions that mean that if you have the, one of the, these conditions failing in some parts of the economy, then that affects conditions in the other parts of the economy, even the parts of the economy where these conditions hold. By the way, lack of these conditions are sometimes called market imperfections. Or distortions. And the reason is economists have this idea of a sort of perfect market where all these conditions are satisfied. And then if a, so a perfect non-distorted market, which of course never existed historically, but never mind. And so we use words like imperfections and distortions to describe deviations from these four conditions. 